So each week for worship, we do three things. We do a 9 a.m. Zoom service, followed by a 10 a.m. in-person service, which is also something you can watch on Zoom. And then we do a video that we send out every Saturday evening. This is the video for August 28th, 2022. And here is the prayer of the day. Let us pray. O God, where hearts are fearful and constricted, grant courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and reassurance. Where impossibilities close every door and window, grant imagination and resistance. Where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So we've done a series on the book of Exodus. We did four weeks on chapter 20, looking at the Ten Commandments. Last week we looked at chapter 1, and this week we are looking at chapter 2. And we, while we're doing this series on Exodus, we have been attaching uh, related gospel stories. Good news according to Matthew, the 11th chapter. Jesus intervenes at the site of injustice. Then they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, it is not written. Is it, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. For they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. The Gospel of the Lord. A reading from the book of Exodus, the second chapter. Moses intervenes at the site of injustice. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then Miriam, the baby's sister, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this, chi <clears throat> Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. One day, as after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting. And he said to the one who was in the wrong, why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, who made you a ruler or a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. So one of the things we're trying to get across when we look at the Ten Commandments from a point of view of the gospel, from the point of view of grace, is that our religion is not about reward and punishment. There are many parts of the Bible which speak of God as a God of reward and punishment, but there are many other parts of the Bible that say the opposite, that God is loving and forgiving and generous and compassionate and forgiving. Um, so you kind of have to work your way through all of that, and it's kind of complicated. We shouldn't go really too much to one way or too much to the other way, uh, realizing that there's some truth in both of those. Um, but overall, I think many people find themselves with a very simple kind of an understanding that's not complicated, and that simple understanding often ends up being reward and punishment. And so it's my job, I think, to kind of help people to go beyond thinking of God in terms of reward and punishment, uh, because the Bible does not give us a simplistic view of God. You may pick out a verse that you're gonna to decide to settle on and be simplistic about it, 
Um, but when you get across the Bible, you realize it's more complicated. But in general, we like to start by asking people not to think of God as simply a God of reward and punishment, not mainly a God of reward and punishment, um, that that's not what God is seeking to communicate in uh, so much of the scripture as we read it. Uh, a few years ago, in a previous uh, presidential administration, you, remember, you may remember the Attorney General um, and another person in the administration saying that the Bible says you should obey the government. The Bible says you should obey the law. If there's a law, you should obey it because that's what the Bible says. Um, some people have used religion in that way to push for blind obedience. Um, people in power sometimes use the Bible, use religion as a way of justifying um, their dominance and their absolute control. Um, and so there's one little verse of Paul that people pick up and they say, here it says, obey the law. Um, so much of the way in which Christians seem to get themselves in trouble by not hearing Jesus talking about love and forgiveness and concern for the sick and concern for the poor and how the meek are blessed and the persecuted are blessed. So many Christians miss that and find themselves picking out one verse and it's very often a verse of Paul. They'll find one verse that says homosexuality is considered a sin. That's coming from Paul, not coming from Jesus. They'll find a verse that says, uh, wives obey your husbands, women shouldn't talk in church, slaves obey your masters. Those are all being plucked out of Paul. Um, so the idea that this government official was using to say the Bible says obey the law and you should obey the law because the Bible says it um, is plucking that one verse out of context, which is so interesting because Paul in context of his life and his ministry is someone who stood up against a dominant government that was persecuting and oppressing people. Paul went to jail. Paul died standing up to a government that was imposing laws that wouldn't allow him to believe and to practice his faith as he, as he wanted to, as did so many, many, many of those early Christians who were um, persecuted. Um, so we shouldn't pick out a verse that says, you should obey your authorities, you should obey the government, you should obey the law, as an absolute. And that's why I think last week's reading and this week's reading are really interesting because while you have this foundational code that we looked at over four weeks, the Ten Commandments, a foundational code of law that establishes society, that establishes civilization for the Jews, for the Christians, for the Western world, you have this foundational code in a story that begins with women breaking the law because they're engaged in civil disobedience that judges a, more, a law to be immoral. Uh, today we have Moses breaking a law that's actually one of the Ten Commandments. It's not just some um, authority that he doesn't trust or he doesn't think is legitimate. It's the Ten Commandments, which have not been given to Moses yet. But before the Ten Commandments, I think people knew that uh, murder was wrong. And we see that Moses has this consciousness of guilt because when he kills the person, he looks to the left and he looks to the right um, to see if he can get away with this. So I think that we want to avoid thinking of God as someone who's concerned mainly with rules and with punishing people uh, severely, rewarding people for good behavior. Um, and then because people look at the world and they say, well, these people are clearly suffering and poor, so God must have punished them. And then these people over here are wealthy and healthy and happy, so God must have blessed them. Um, and it comes in a way that just says, well, the status quo must be what God wants. But the Bible does not tell us that God loves the status quo. Um, God is usually very upset and very uh, grieved by the status quo and speaks about that that way. So this, this book, Exodus, has a foundational legal code. It begins with people standing up against immoral, unjust laws. It begins... Uh, with Moses, who sees someone being beaten, who sees the forced labor that's happening, and he intervenes and kills the person. Um, now, you may say, well, he didn't have to kill the person. He could have just intervened. Um, so maybe it's disproportionate to what he's doing. Um, but maybe the forced labor was so abusive and so horrible um, that that was justified. And maybe he thought the person was being beaten too severely that they were going to be you know, severely uh, impaired 
or even killed and that he thought it was justified to intervene. Maybe he just kind of lost his cool, uh, her, uh, you know, intervened a little too much, lost control, and the result was somebody being killed. At any rate, it's interesting that this is again in this book of foundational legal code. This is the man with these bloody hands who will receive that foundational legal code that says thou shalt not murder. Um, that's who God chose, chooses to give. And that's what this story is telling us, that that man who received the Ten Commandments from God had blood on his hands. Um, because it's not about him, it's not about Moses and how deserving he was. It's about the fact that God calls us, all of us, to be instruments of God's work, to be messengers of God's uh, um, love and healing and compassion and forgiveness. Um, so it's very important to kind of put it in that context. Um, so there's, there's a portion in the Ten Commandments which says, the sins of the father will be visited upon the children and the grandchildren. And people take that to mean, yeah, there it is, God rewards and punishes. Um, but I, I, I think um, I've spoken before and I'll just say quickly that very often there are consequences to people's sins. That it's not God intervening in a random way or in a freakish way to punish somebody in a way that's unrelated to what their actions are. Sins produce consequences. And the reason God is telling us these things are sins is because they hurt us, they hurt others. That's what it means for it to be a sin that God is concerned about. God sees us hurting ourselves, hurting each other, and says, this is a sin, and you need to understand the consequences of that. God does not remove the consequence. God does not remove our free will. We have our free will to commit these sins. The consequence is still there to carry on from, from our activity. Uh, Richard Rohr is a writer who uh, I like very much um, in terms of his description of Christianity. Um, and he once put it this way, we are not punished for our sins which is the way so many of us have been taught. We are punished by our sins. And I think that's a helpful way to realize that the consequences are there, not because God intervenes and says, I wanna give you a consequence for this. Um, the consequences are there. God is telling us to be mindful of these consequences, but gives us the free will. And then we'll find out, um, we'll learn uh, by our mistakes that there are consequences if we don't listen to God and to God's direction. And if we don't listen to God, that's not uh, God breaking off relations with us. It's not God uh, casting us away. God allows the consequences generally uh, to go forward and is still there with us, loving and caring and supporting us and helping us. And God's word is there to continue to help us, to guide us, uh, to be doing the right thing. Uh, speaking of uh, sin and the way in which each Sunday we get together and we confess our sins, we remember that we are sinners. Uh, last week, we read the Declaration to the American Indian and Alaska Native Peoples from the ELCA Church Council um, that was released last October um, because it was part of the, um, the programming at the Churchwide uh, Assembly in Ohio uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So that was a part of uh, the discussion that they had and a part of the activities and a part of the direction that we have going forward is to be thinking about how we address old racism by removing it, dismantling it, repairing it, um, and looking for ways to make sure that we're not doing that in the future. So during the service, uh, we heard that declaration, most of the declaration, not the entire thing, but uh, kind of the core of the declaration of the ELCA to American Indian and Alaska Native peoples. Um, so I'm gonna show that to you now and then show you uh, the rest of the um, the rest of the worship service for last week so that you can see uh, how the service went last week, hear the prayers, hear the singing, and uh, see the people at worship. And I hope you enjoy it. And you can leave a comment um, or a reaction down below. <laughs> Uh, the Lutherans every three years have a national gathering, the Lutherans of the ELCA, and they just had their gathering the week before last in Ohio, and it's five days. It's five days of worship, sitting in plenaries for discussions, um, hearing information and reports, having elections. We elected a new vice president. So I wanted to bring you just a little bit of what happened um, in Ohio uh, this past week, one of the declarations uh, that was read. And Laura's going to help me, and Kathy's going to help me. 
because it's that long. So if you turn to page 14, So this is work that came out of the last triennial assembly where there was a re repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery was theological justification and approval for stealing people, land and anything else. The church gave its approval for people to go out into the world and to colonize and to enslave people. That was a doctrine called the doctrine of discovery. In 2016, we repudiated that because we thought it wasn't a good idea. And we're also thinking about the ways in which we need to continue to understand the ways in which we sometimes get ourselves into these situations. Uh, so part of what they did uh, following on the um, uh, repudiation of the doctrine of, of discovery was the ELCA Ch Church Council issued a declaration to American Indian and Alaska Native people, kind of expanding on understanding the damage that we've done and how we need to repair it. Uh, so we're gonna begin on page 14. Our confession to the American Indian and Alaska native communities of the ELCA, we confess that we have not listened to the stories of indigenous people and have not taken the time to understand history. We have devalued indigenous religions and life ways and have not challenged the invisibility of indigenous people in American society. We have treated American Indians and Alaska Natives as a minority group rather than, a, than as a sovereign nation. We have not taken seriously the importance of land and how complicit we are in accepting the benefits of stolen land. We confess that in our church life, we have failed to keep promises about funding and anatomy made at the inception of the ALCA. We confess that we have underfunded and over interfered in the workings of indigenous congregations and ministries. While we adopted the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery in 2016, we have not yet taken action to live out the repudiation. We confess that we are complicit in the annihilation of native people and your cultures, languages, and religion, and that we have refused to truly recognize the harm that we have caused our native siblings. We confess that we must continue to learn more about our complicity and the roles of our church played in dehumanizing indigenous peoples, especially as it relates to the forced assimilation, abuse, and death in Indian boarding schools, adoption, and foster care, the ecological damages in Indian country and beyond due to climate change, the breaking of sacred treaties meant to govern the relationships between native sovereign nations and the U.S. federal government and missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and relatives. Confession to the American Indian and Alaska Native community in the US. We confess that we, as a church with European and immigrant roots, have benefited from the perpetrated settler colonialism. We have not over the years repudiated the underlying white supremacy that allowed European settlers to invade all tribal lands. And that presently allows our church, our congregations and white and non-native populations to reside on stolen lands that rightfully belong to indigenous peoples. We have not challenged our own racism that has caused us to treat native people as less than human. We have not understood the implications of the broken treaties that have benefited settlers and decimated sovereign nations. We confess that we as an institution have not joined the struggle that native youth are leading in the flight in the fight for climate justice, voting rights, the protection from COVID-19. Nor have we honored and learned from their wisdom and courage. Our confession to non-indigenous communities of the ELCA. We confess that we, as a church with European and immigrant roots, have benefited from broken treaties, our participation and complicity in the annihilation of indigenous peoples and culture, and our continued racist oppression of native people and their foreign sovereign nations. We confess that our congregations are built on the original homelands of indigenous people, 
that we have continually refused to include the truth about our treatment and exploitation of our native siblings and their lands as central to American history. We also confess that we have not learned our own church's history related to indigenous peoples. We confess that we allowed for the effectiveness of the National Indian Lutheran Board, an organization that demonstrated historic solidarity and worked for justice for indigenous people to diminish when it was dissolved at the beginning of the church in 1988. We further confess that the church did not proactively support continued effectiveness through the work of the ELCA's American Indian Alaska Native Lutheran Association. Our pledge to the American Indian and Alaska Native communities of the ELCA, we give thanks for the American Indian and Alaska Native Lutherans who have been present from the beginning of the ELCA and its predecessor bodies sharing their wisdom, steadfastness, and leadership to help make our church better. Therefore, we commit to working toward the elimination of racism and white supremacy that exists in our church's governance, leadership, congregations, and membership that has always had and continues to have detrimental effects on Native communities and our ELCA Native siblings, congregations, and ministries. We commit to honor Native leadership, learn from them, and secure a place for that leadership at decision-making tables. We commit to developing a strategy with the American Indian Alaska Native community, including a mechanism to grow the Native American Ministries Fund that was placed in the ELCA's care. We commit to consistently communicate American Indian and Alaska Native concerns across the church and to respond to those concerns accordingly, and we will begin celebrating holidays and anniversaries associated with Indigenous people appropriately. We commit to work for the inclusion of Indigenous history in all K-12 cur curriculum in public schools and to develop effective education opportunities for non-Indigenous leaders and membership of our church. We commit to supporting forms of leadership, education, and certification that are Native-focused and Native-led, and we commit to developing future Native leaders, pastors, and theologians. We commit to encourage and support, wherever possible, the buyback and return of tribal land and further commit to support creative programs resulting in reparations for stolen lands. Our pledge to the American Indian and Alaska Native community in the United States. We commit to better understanding the doctrine of discovery identifying the ways in which it is still used to oppress indigenous people, and how best to realize our church's repudiation of such a sinful ideology. Therefore, we commit to partnership with native nations and with native organizations that educate, support, and interpret the rights of indigenous people, including the National Congress of American Indians and the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. We commit to national and international advocacy through our ELCA Washington office the Lutheran Office for World Community at the United Nations, as well as in state and local legislative bodies. We commit to learning about treaties and to engage our members in advocacy for treaty rights as they affect current issues of justice. Our pledge to non-Indigenous communities of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. We commit to strengthening our anti-oppression efforts with a greater focus on realizing justice and equity for indigenous people. Therefore, we commit to providing educational materials and opportunities to help our church and our non-indigenous members better understand our repudiation of the doctrine of discovery and our complicity in its long range implications. We commit to learning about the church's role in and the centuries long policy of the US federal government of family separation and to eradicate native culture and identity through indoctrination and forced assimilation of native children at Indian boarding schools, forced and illegal adoptions to white families and foster care. We commit to supporting the healing of survivors of Indian boarding schools, adoption and foster care and their descendants while advocating for policies that will bring both truth and justice. Similarly, we commit to advocacy for and being in solidarity with tribal nations MMIWGR organizations, families, and friends who have long been searching for their loved ones, indigenous women, girls, and relatives who have gone missing or who have been murdered. We commit to supporting tribal nations in their work to preserve their languages, 
and we commit to begin the practice of land acknowledgments at all expressions of the church. Thank you, Laura and Kathy, for helping with that. So it's important as we recognize mistakes that we've made, that we not just confess that it was wrong, but that we talk about how we can do things better. And when we've been looking at the Ten Commandments over the past few weeks, we've talked about how we don't just want to not do harm, we want to do positive things. And if we confess that something has been wrong, we need to figure out a way to live into a better way to making uh, the world a better place. Good morning. Uh, this is more people than I was expecting. So I think I have to send some people home. Uh, Lori and Don, if we get too many people and we run out of seats, um, just because we need more seats or we need more space, um, just over in the corner here is some folding chairs. If we use up those, there's more outside the men's room. Thank you to our ushers. We're going to begin on page three with what we call our brief order of confession and forgiveness. And one of these days, we're going to do the long version. 
If you're feeling especially sinful, let me know and we'll do the long version. If you're able to stand with me, please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the maker of heaven and earth, the word made flesh, the Lord and giver of life. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Mighty God, you resist those who are proud and give grace to those who are humble. Give us the humility of your Son, that we may embody the generosity of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to continue now with our psalm. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for showing the church. Good morning, Uncle. I'm reading the book of Psalm 121. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And Jesus name my pray, amen. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Good News According to Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus is anointed at Bethany. Jesus draws our attention to an act of love, which we should always remember. While Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume, which he poured on his head as he reclined at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant and asked, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus asked, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful deed to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this perfume on me, she has prepared my body for burial. Truly, I tell you, 
wherever this gospel is preached in all the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 1. The Ten Commandments are a part of the story of Exodus, the liberation of the slaves. It is a story which begins with an abuse of government and women who engage in civil disobedience. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Europe in the 1930s was a bleak time. We know that's a very bleak part of history. When Adolf Hitler became chancellor, the head of the government, he accomplished it through an election and a presidential decree. His powers were expanded by the parliament, the Reichstag. The parliament passed his laws, taking away the legal rights of Jews and laws barring Jews from certain professions and businesses. If you remember the letter from a Birmingham jail, that we heard read during our worship the last few years. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King talks about how everything Hitler did was legal. It is true insofar as it refers to some of the most horrible things that Hitler did. He negotiated his way into taking territory from neighboring countries. He did that as long as it worked, and when it didn't, he just broke the treaties and invaded. Not exactly legal, but we can see that he did try to be legal in the beginning. He worked with the parliament to pass his oppressive and genocidal laws legally. On the other hand, it is also true that Hitler served time in jail for his early efforts to come to power by violence. But he wrote a book and he otherwise tried to convince people and he convinced enough members of the government to support him or to say that they supported him in his aims and his methods. In his letter to a Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King, in explaining civil disobedience, wrote about biblical figures from the book of Daniel. He wrote about, quote, the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace for refusing to bow down to the king's image. Their conscience would not allow them to obey that law. We can also read about Daniel in the lion's den, when King Darius insisted that people should address all their prayers to him. That's how Daniel gets arrested, for praying his own prayer in his own home to his own God. The book of Esther tells us about Queen Vashti, who refuses to be entertainment for King Ahasuerus and his guests She's replaced. She's replaced by Esther, who in time will also defy the law. The law forbidding her to enter the king's throne room uninvited. She decides she must try to intervene and stop an atrocity. I will go to the king, she said, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Some of St. Paul's letters that we read on Sunday morning were written from jail. Beyond our faith are more examples. Gandhi was arrested nearly a dozen times. Dr. King writes powerfully and with many historical and religious references in his defense of civil disobedience. 
there is a time when people of faith must oppose unjust or immoral laws. But Dr. King says, one must be ready to go to jail. The point of civil disobedience is not to undermine law and order, but to hold officials to account. To hold them to account when they act unlawfully, unconstitutionally, or immorally. We may choose to oppose a law, or an agency, or an official, but still abide by the legal structure. Today we read about Shifra and Pua, two women who defy the king of Egypt, because they know he is evil in his order to kill Hebrew babies. On the news, you may have heard, you may have seen, you may have read certain elected officials criticizing the Federal Bureau of Investigation for a recent controversy. The FBI and all law enforcement rely on our support and trust. If they do something that we think is wrong, we need to hold them accountable. But we would do that by the rule of law. To just criticize the FBI, to just say they're corrupt or political, without some understanding of their procedures, how they go before a judge and they get a warrant, to attack their motives or their legitimacy without basis is, I think, irresponsible. There is a place for criticizing government and it is not rhetoric, it is not conspiracy theories. If we seriously undermine law enforcement agencies we will find ourselves in a nation of lawlessness. There is a place for civil disobedience. We see it all throughout the Bible. Jesus being unjustly arrested, tried and executed is one of many examples of people standing defiant in the face of illegitimate authority, no matter what. The last four weeks we read about the Ten Commandments. It's interesting to note that this foundational legal code is part of a story that begins with people, including the two women we read about today, who defy an immoral law, an immoral system. I love the way these women, these midwives, reply to the king's inquiry as to why they're not carrying out his order. Can you imagine people surrounding a head of state making up excuses and distracting him from their attempts and their own attempts. That's the way they make their own attempts at resistance. Why aren't you doing what I told you to do? The king says to the midwives. Well, because the Hebrew women, they're vigorous and they give birth before we even get there. Seems like a lie, like an effort to evade accountability, dissembling. They're saying that they're not defying the king's order on purpose kind of funny. It's like they're mocking him. They're resisting him and quietly laughing at him. The relationship of Christians to their government should be handled carefully and understood clearly. We should support law and order and contribute to the needs of our neighbors. An open democratic society that is responsive to its people is a society that we should support and work towards even if imperfect. Knowing it is imperfect, as we are imperfect. We should be careful not to get caught up in nationalism, not to become nationalists, and especially not to merge national interests with faith commitments. Nationalism is a narrow, chauvinistic, egocentric sensibility, which is very dangerous. And when you merge that with, Christ, with religion, it is even more dangerous. We want a society that respects the freedom of religion and conscience. We want that for ourselves. God wants us to protect it for our neighbors. We should look for ways to be good neighbors as individuals and also as a church, not imposing our views, but participating in thoughtful dialogue, looking for cooperation, and protecting important principles like consent, consensus, 
mutuality. We should value our secular and multi-faith partners and live among all of our neighbors in ways that uphold justice, support mercy, and walk humbly with our God. You are able to stand. You don't want to sit the whole time, right? Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Holy God, hold this broken world in your tender embrace, especially those impacted by the opioid epidemic. We remember those afflicted and especially those who have lost loved ones to the COVID virus. May we be thankful, loving God, for healthcare workers and first responders. Each of us has a way to serve you by loving and helping our neighbor. Remind us of our mission to be your hands for people in need. God of love, hear our prayer. Loving God, bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Paul, we ask your blessings on our Deacon Philip leading worship at Epiphany Lutheran and Reverend Dr. Martha leading the congregation of Fordham in the Bronx. Remember us, remind us of our mission to be your hands for people in need. God of grace, fill yes, us yes, with yes, your strength. Yes. Merciful God, help us to be tender with those in need. Show us how to value people, appreciate differences, and remain calm in conflict. God of grace, Fill us with your strength. Holy Lord, hear us as we join our prayers together to lift up Olivia and Inga, Angie, Marek, Karen, Bill, Dennis, Pam, Santa, John, Karen, Julia, Joe, Carol and Dan, Erica, Rick, Phil, Jamie, Emmett, Muriel, Kay, Pat, Bob and Suzanne, Russell, Johnny, Arlene, Paul, Michael, John, Elaine, Tessa, Linda, Sandy, Ernesto, Deborah, Susie, David, and Missy. God of grace, strengthen all newborns, including Caleb and Thomas. Bless those recently baptized, including Macy and Amelia. Bless those who mourn the loss of loved ones, including the families of Jane Galvin, Charlie Calamanis, Herb Glifford, and all who mourn Carl Peck and Matthew Verger on the one year anniversary of their deaths. We celebrate with all who are having birthdays, including Amelia, Ali, Clara, Cecilia, Thomas, Naki, William, and Aaron. God of grace, bless us. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God. 
and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Please be seated. So the sign of peace in sign language is this, and this, and this. It is peace with you. Very good. Uh, can I get a volunteer to pass the plate for the offering? And what I'm going to do is ask you to come to the front. And we'll see if anyone raises their hand to ask. Oh, you got one taker right here. Okay. Thank you for that, Lord. provider, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary and a joyful thing that we should always and everywhere offer thanks and praise to your God through Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who gave himself over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death. He is the one who took bread and gave thanks, broke the bread, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, which will be given for you. In the same way, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks, and he gave the cup for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It will be shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Holy, mighty, and merciful God, you call us to your table. Help us that we may always welcome others in full forgiveness, love and compassion, and a wide embrace of acceptance. Send now your Holy Spirit and graciously gather a diverse people with a bold faith. Remembering then his death and resurrection, we take this bread and cup, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and serve you as your priestly people. We remember our Lord's victory over death, and we give thanks for all the saints of blessed memory, now celebrating this meal in the heavenly presence of the Creator, Sanctifier, and Redeemer. Send your spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith and truth, that we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, to whom all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Christ's body was given for us. You may be seated.
Body of Christ in you. Body of Christ in you. Body of Christ in you. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless your mind with eagerness to know others. May the Lord bless your heart with willingness to help. May the Lord bless your body with strength to serve. May the Lord bless your soul with assurance of forgiveness, compassion, and steadfast love. Amen.
Punkt, wie viel? Just a couple of announcements. Oh. Just a couple of announcements. I think it's a big help when we're trying to worship. Are you hearing this? This the system works how it works. It works when it works, and it doesn't work when it doesn't work. We may need a new one of those. Okay. Well, it got through the service anyway. Uh, just to mention that um, we're so happy to have Claudia with us. And it sounds so nice when we're all hearing each other singing. Uh, so being close together really helps with that. And Claudia is going to take vacation next week. Uh, so let's let her know how much we love and appreciate her. Uh, if you didn't come in up the stairs, um, if you didn't come in the front door here, you missed the flowers uh, that Lori's husband, Dave, uh, planted. And they are amazing, those flowers. What are they called? Do you know what they're called? Petunias. Petunias. So those big, I don't know what color that is. It's like a, Purple. it's like your shirt, actually. <laughs> they're, they're beautiful and they're doing very well. Uh, and we thank Dave for that and for a lot of other help he's given around the yard. Uh, I just wanted to mention that there's a program tonight on uh, CNN. I included it in the email that I sent out about anti-Semitism in America. Uh, I think a lot of us have just grown so tired of watching the news. And especially when the news is just, this bad thing happened, and that bad thing happened, and this person said this, and this person said that. Um, but I think some news programs uh, try to give you a bigger picture and try to give you a little more historical understanding. Um, so on CNN tonight at uh, nine o'clock, they're gonna be talking about kind of the recent events in recent years of anti-Semitism. Uh, and I think it'll surprise you uh, if you've not been following it to realize um, how bad it's gotten. Um, and if you maybe speak to your friends, they'll tell you that they don't wanna wear a Jewish star in public. Uh, they don't wanna wear a yarmulke in public in New York, in New York City. Uh, so we know that there's an increase in violence in a number of ways. Uh, people who are Muslim or perceived to be Muslim, um, Asians, Asian Americans, um, elderly people. Um, so kind of understanding that there's kind of a, a mentality um, that's at work here and understanding that all of us can be a little bit more aware and all of us can think about how we can make that better. Um, so I think if you watch that tonight and if you don't see it tonight, it of course is uh, streaming and you'll be able to see that. Uh, not too long ago, I handed out a chapter uh, from a book about anti-Semitism. Um, it's not a long book, and I gave you chapter 11, Commuting with Shylock, um, a woman talking about her and her son, her 10-year-old son, trying to explain to him um, what anti-Semitism is in terms of its history, in terms of its impact. Um, the woman who is doing the program tonight on CNN also wrote an article talking about her 10-year-old son and trying to explain to him as a Jewish boy um, what's happening and how to understand it and how to be in the world, in a world like that. So I hope you can watch those. So I commend it to you. And our sending, go in peace, love your neighbor. Thanks. Be with you.
Yeah, just spread them out around. Yeah. Thank you. 